of light. We can't quit. It's about freedom. It's not about a revival, but it's about a revolution that brings forth freedom. Your choice chooses you. Come on, warriors of light. We can't quit. Follow truth. It's not about revival, but it's about a revolution. Your choice chooses you. Are you ready to dive deep? Let's seek together and move beyond the status quo. For the hidden things belong to the Lord. There is a generation who is no longer satisfied with playing church. This is your day. This is your hour. It's time for the real seekers to stand up and be counted. This is The Quest for Truth with your host, Karina Pataki. Your choice chooses you. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to The Quest for Truth, Hidden Mysteries TV. And I am so excited to have with us a special guest, another incredible special guest. And her name is Barbara Simmons. Barbara is an author. Uh, she has two amazing books. The first one is, I love this title, Escaping Christianity, Finding Christ. And we're going to talk about that because I, just the title alone is just so powerful. And, um, and the message that it portrays and it, it reveals is incredible. And then the second book that she has is Musing from an Ex-Christian Fundamentalist. Barbara, welcome, welcome. It's so wonderful to meet you and to have you with us. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, thank you again. Um, and Barbara, you have quite an amazing um, story just even looking at the titles, the titles of your books, um, you came from or out of a fundamental uh, Christian background. Do you mind sharing that with us, who you were back then and your transition into awakening into spirituality out of Christianity? Sure. Um, my journey began when I was really little. Um, my parents had best friends uh, that had a little uh, baby that was born uh, very ill, and they found out that she had terminal cancer, and um, they got involved with, uh, oh gosh, the evangelical movement in the 1960s, and uh, the baby was healed radically overnight. Um, free of cancer and was written up in the medical journals. Um, I think it was 1968. And so my parents, uh, being their best friends, got involved and with Christian fundamentalism. And it was kind of my uh, immersion into going down the rabbit hole. And uh, I stayed within that for 43 years and on and off in my teen years. And more so as an adult and got involved at a, uh, a spirit-filled, charismatic uh, Methodist church here in my city, got mm. involved in deliverance ministry. So I was an exorcist for, Me I don't too. know, a decade, <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> saw many, many miracles. Mm. And then, um, but we also saw, in addition to the miracles within the deliverance ministry, we were seeing some things that I would describe as maybe shamanic healing. Um, and we would see things happen over regions and territories, uh, mm -hmm. nations. And I kind of got in trouble with that because it looked odd. Um, but we had a volunteer staff of around a dozen people that would come and help. And we would travel to different cities and do a deliverance in mass. Like maybe there'd be 50 or 75 people and, um, you know, we saw some amazing things, but then things stopped making sense to me. And I started asking questions. And among those questions is, you know, the, the concept of hell and torture, torment, separation from God, who is supposed to love me and who tells me to love my enemies and pray for them while he tortures his. Yes. You know, I just, I just had a kind of a, a crisis of faith and um, 
you know, I call it my spiritual breakdown. One day I just lost the terminology that came with fundamentalism. I actually thought I was having, you know, maybe a stroke or something because I lost the word saved. I didn't know what that meant anymore because all of a sudden I had this concept or this understanding that being saved meant immortality, that there wasn't a death process to experience. And so that really uh, started me on a, a journey of, of questioning. But when that happens, when you begin to question the very um, serious uh, tenets of the faith, people get very threatened. Yes, yes. And um, certainly my, my pastor was threatened. And as someone, um, you know, you can only rise above where your covering is within Christianity. And he didn't want to go to those places. So we ended up parting ways. And, but along with that came a lot of accusation, came a lot of rumors, came a lot of, you know, falsehoods, you know, you're a Satanist, you're new age, you're, you know, and, but that was 1999. And so I've been out of the institution um, since then and have really enjoyed, <laughs> I've really enjoyed my Sunday mornings, <laughs> just no longer having to um, be a part of that. And the, one of the main things that's happened to me in the last 22 years is I've regained my critical thinking. Wow. Which I had lost. Yes. Mm -hmm wow uh, yeah, yeah wow yeah um because you know what we've been told is you're nothing but a sheep i'm your i'm your pastor i'm the one that leads you therefore you think as you have to run it by me and if i agree with it then you're good to think on that um wow okay go keep going so from from that point from when you stepped out and uh, you got your critical thinking back what happened what what was the next phase of your awakening or from crossing over? Well, in uh, 2000, 2001, I, when you're free, when you begin to step outside of the, of the restriction of the way that you think, yes. you know, I was bombarded with a lot of different thinking and I even, I remember one day I was <clears throat> driving past my neighborhood and there's a Catholic church uh, near our home. And I had the thought run across my mind, um, is it wrong to worship Jesus? And I thought, no, I don't want to open that can of worms. But what I did is, is I ended up going home and I had a conversation with whatever spiritual entity that wasn't physical, you know, would listen. And um, I asked the hard questions and said, I am willing to lay all of this aside. Um, I feel that if I am in error, that you will love me enough to bring me wherever I need to be. Yes. And I saw this open vision of this big bubble and I was sitting on my living room couch and I saw this big sphere. And inside the sphere, I saw a lot of little bubbles. And I asked, what is this? And a finger pointed to one of the little bubbles and it was labeled Christianity. And then I saw all these other uh, bubbles get labels of, you know, Hinduism and Native American spiritism and, mm -hmm. You know, Islam, and it, it was just populated with all these different, you know, beliefs, many of them Christian, Catholicism, and Seventh day Adventist, and you know, whatever. Right. And um, I said, But where am I? And it pointed to the bubble called Christianity, and it said, You're not there anymore. And I was good with that. And so I just had to continue to. Um, read, study, meditate. Um, but mainly, I, I just gained back the ability to think without being told what to think. Right. To read without 
looking at somebody else's interpretation right and not to be afraid anymore of being separated you know the thing that that really happened was separation from people not god yes you know the who and what we consider god is is love and does not behave like humans you know humans are you know they they're the ones that that are that behave poorly but then we had a, you want me to keep going? Yes, please. Uh-huh. So we had an event in our, in our lives. My son um, joined uh, the military after 9-11. And he was always kind of a wild child. Um, and I remember him before going, uh, uh, heading off to boot camp, he came up to my office where I was working and showed me this big angel that he had tattooed on his back. And it had this big flowing robe and a sword and and he said mama you don't have to worry about me you know over there because we knew he was going to Iraq you don't have to worry about me over there because an angel's got my back well after two years he came home and out of the army and my husband was uh one time he woke up in the middle of the night and he was just drenched with sweat and and he said, I had a, a, a vision. He said, I, I don't think it was a dream, but I had a vision of Chris, that's my son's name, without limbs. Mm. He said, what do you think that is? And I said, it, it's probably some kind of leftover, you know, psychic crap from, you know, unexploded IEDs and, and fear, you know, being that, you know, that was just so prevalent. Yes. During that time. And, and then he woke up the next night and, and had the same vision. And the night after that, it was three nights in a row where he saw my son missing limbs. Well, then six months later, he took off on a motorcycle trip with Chris uh, and my youngest son, excuse me, to Houston (laughs) to a motorcycle show. And um, Chris had a, unbeknownst to us, um, had a heavy Mm -hmm. night of drinking Mm -hmm. and they took off and, uh, but there was an accident on the way and Chris um, went into the oncoming lane to pass a minivan on a single lane highway and uh, mm-hmm. never came out of the oncoming lane and impacted uh, an oncoming pickup truck F-250 at 70 miles an hour. Wow. And he, uh, he was going 70, the truck was going at least 70. And so the impact was 140 miles an hour and he wasn't wearing a helmet. And my husband, Lyle, witnessed that as well as my youngest son, Keith. And the uh, motorcycle exploded and they rode through a curtain of debris. And uh, when they, uh, the chassis of Chris's motorcycle was actually jettisoned back uh, toward them. And so they had to, uh, they had to dodge that. And when they came to a stop, Chris, my son was laying on the side of the road, uh, missing an arm. It had come off during the impact and his hip was mm-hmm. split open, um, mm. down to his ankle. Wow. And wow. he was, uh, wasn't breathing. There was no blood coming out of his severed arm. Oh. And he was, pallor and he was dead yeah wow and my husband um he said he collapsed next to chris Mm -hmm. and he said that a a noise came out of him that wasn't human Mm. and he said it was a wail um a groan and he looked around and stood up and cars were stopping and um um People were running up to them and he looked at my youngest son and asked him if he was okay. And, and he said, time was moving very, very slowly. And he looked back down at Chris and, you know, realized that he was, he was gone. And he said, his knees gave out again. And he um, kind of landed on, on top of Chris with a, grabbed him up into his arms and pulled him to his chest. And he said that sound came out of him again. And he was there for a minute or two making this sound and laid him back down. 
and stood up again. And a woman came running to him saying that she was an off-duty paramedic, Mm. EMT. And her husband was walking towards them with my son's arm. Wow, wow, wow. Grieved off the road. And and he said, he's, uh, Lyle, my husband said he's gone. Mm-hmm. And the woman said, no, he's, he's not. And Lyle mm-hmm. turned to look at Chris and Chris was starting to, to bleed. Wow. His wounds and um, respirate. And so they, they transported him to uh, by helicopter to Houston's uh, Memorial Herman, where they saved his life. And um, I ended up taking off his leg and, uh, but I was in the emergency room and but when I, when I met my husband down at the hospital and he told me what had happened, cause he didn't tell me, mm-hmm. I had to drive an hour and a half to Houston. He didn't tell me, wow. but I knew, you know, I knew something was wrong. And when I got to him in the hospital and he, I was on my way back to see Chris cause they were going to bring me back to talk to him so thankful that I, I ran into my husband first because he told me what happened. Mm-hmm. And he said his arm came off and I saw, I looked at my husband and his legs buckled. Yes. He, and he steadied himself on the, on the kiosk where we were standing. And the only thing that came out of my mouth was, baby, your, your dreams. Mm-hmm. So as odd as that sounded, I felt like we were somewhat prepared Mm-hmm. for that and during surgery when they were working to save his life I had uh was looking at a salt water aquarium and I felt this lifting up and out of my body and uh, I was internally hysterical but externally calm yes and I was racing way ahead thinking how is this how is this young man going to walk if he doesn't have an arm so that he can grip a crutch how how is that going to work and my mind was racing way ahead and and so here I am now feeling like I'm standing on a waterbed and I'm above my body just by a a couple of inches and a voice spoke to me Mm -hmm. and said "Uh, Barbara it's time that you remember Mm. and the voice went on to say he chose this and so did you And immediately I felt myself land back on my feet and I was observing the, what was just spoken to me and kind of wanted to argue with it. But then I heard a voice from back here say, I remember. And then I was like, who who is that? And why are you speaking for me? Um, But the voice continued and told me that there's no suffering in vain. And that all has value and purpose. And that single event launched me on a whole different trajectory of understanding who we are, why we're here. And um, Chris is, uh, my son is alive and well and running a business here in town. And he's just uh, has such an amazing story. He's really an inspiration. Yes. But that yes. was, a, that was leaving the church was one catapult, but then that experience pushed me into a whole different uh, direction. And I had several experiences after that. Um, one telling me that, it, that the role that I would play mm-hmm. would be to bridge the gap between dimensions, uh, between this age and the next. Mm-hmm. And that someone needed to stand in that place and mm-hmm. just see that there was a different age pressing in upon us. And so that's what I feel like I've done with my life since then, is stand in that gap. That's absolutely incredible. Um, It's incredible how the events that you went through to where it got you to this point, this this moment in time where you can stand in that gap, as you said, uh, between the age that passed and this one to come. So that's so incredible. And you know, as we started this interview, and I mentioned the first book, your first book, um, which is uh, Escaping Christianity, Finding Christ. You know, Barbara, maybe some people that are watching will be like, 
what do you mean? What, wait a minute. Isn't Jesus Christian? What, what are you talking about? Um, I know what you mean, and we have viewers that know what you mean, but there are, you know, it's a big Christian audience that are awakening or in the process of awakening or maybe just checking us out that may not understand. So what do you mean? Because like you said, you came from a fundamental um, Christian background, deliverance. Actually, your journey sounds quite similar to mine, um, you know, doing ministry and things like that. So how can you say now, leaving Christianity, but finding Christ? So explain that, please, to, to the viewers. Sure. And, you know, that to get to that point, that was almost 15 years of regaining critical thinking and wow. being willing to step away from some of those um, programs, because mm -hmm. that's exactly what it is. It's, it's brainwashing. Yep and it's programming. And there's a reason why there's, uh, gosh, between 38 and 42,000 different and disagreeing Christian sects and denominations. And it's because they, they can't agree. Um, no one has it all right. And so I, I got to the point where I, I was fearless. I had lost just about everything, all of my friends, my position, my standing, my ministry, everything. And so I came to understand that Christ is, is not a surname. It's a function. It's a verb. It's not a noun. It is a mode of being. And the term was around and predates Christianity by hundreds, if not more than a thousand years. And it simply means uh, a being that is awake, has awakened to the reality that they are indwelled by God, by the divine. And the pattern that I saw within Christianity, I no longer saw as outside from me. I started to see the, the Bible and the Bible stories as incredible metaphor and allegory. So therefore, Mary wasn't one person that was overshadowed, but that co the collective, the human race is Mary and that we have been overshadowed and our divinity, um, the DNA molecule was penetrated by something holy mm -hmm. and divine. And so when I started to see scripture as allegory, that opened, <laughs> That opened up the playing field, but of course got me in a lot of trouble with the literalists because they, um, through programming and fear, right, have to see it differently. And so fearlessness was also a big part of my journey and to discover that Christ is not something outside of me. And even the disciples aren't outside of me. They're multidimensional aspects of this priest. Yes. You know, so a lot of things changed for me, but I, but I also have to, I have to say this as a disclaimer. We are going from knowledge, which is the left brain into knowing, right. which is the right brain. And so the things that I'm talking about can't be taught. And I recognize that years ago, you know, I, I said, <laughs> I said to these, this non-physical aspect of a spirit being, where would listen, I don't even know what to call it. But I said, why would you give me this information? Why would I have this information and nobody wants to hear what I have to say? And they answered me and said, if you would just become the message, you will have more of an impact than if you stood on a stage in front of tens of thousands of people just become and so that's been that's been my journey and my quest and so these these people that don't agree and that attack and that you know they're good where they are that's part of their journey no one can Absolutely. tell them Correct. differently they have to experience it and until they come to that place of being open and willing and broken They'll stay right where they are, and they are not wrong where they are. They have a particular view 
and it's not wrong. Yeah. It's just part of the fractal. Yeah, absolutely. So again, I, I just, I love the title of that book, Barbara. It's so powerful to me because the truth of the matter is Jesus did not come to establish a religion. Right. So Jesus was not Christian. Right. And I know, you know, even when you say that, uh, it can be just, just like, oh, but he did not. That's just the truth. Jesus came to show us who we are and to show who the father really is, which mm -hmm. he is love. And so when you talk about leaving Christianity and finding Christ, it's so powerful to me um, because you are literally saying you're stepping outside of the control of the programming through religion and fear, which is that's how it has been, um, into the fullness of what we're supposed to be walk become become and walk and do so let's go back to christ because you said something there that it is not a title which yes uh it's a verb what do you mean by that what do you, just expand on that a little bit for our viewers okay so a verb by definition is a mode of being christ from what i have been told shown experienced is uh, you know the word comes from the word anoint yes. and if you take oil and rub it into the palm of your hands and into your skin and then someone says hey give me that oil back you can't because you've been anointed because spirit and biology have become one that's christ Mm -hmm. There's no other way around it. That is Christ. And it's the, it's the joining together of the masculine and the feminine principles. And we know that what happens when you join masculine and feminine is that life happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, Christ, you know, Jesus, when he said, I am the way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the father, but by me, if you break all that down, if you, if you throw away all the religion that you've been taught, what he's saying is the way to the father, the progenitor, the first cause, the source, the, the way everything comes into being, the way is not by raising a hand, walking an aisle, accepting Jesus into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior, none of that. None of that is scriptural, but the way is what Jesus patterned, which was love. And it is a frequency key. Yes. You cannot access the creative power and potential of the universe without first practicing love. Yes. Non-judgment. That's the way to the father. And it doesn't matter who you are what you espouse, you achieve that key or tone or frequency and you become a compatible match to the creative impetus of the entire universe. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing stopping it. So Christ is when the human being has submitted to spirit and they have become one. Spirit has found a dwelling place inside the human body and they are now cohabitating and working as one. That's all it is. There's no other burden laid upon a human being other than to love and to raise your own personal frequency to match that of the creative source, power, progenitor of the universe. Yeah, that's very good the way you're explaining it. That makes so much sense. Now, Barbara, you had written an article that Wendy shared with me um, about the 40 lashes. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very, very powerful. I would love for you to share that, um, the thought and the heart of the revelation that you released through that with the viewers. You know, all we have to do is look at the pattern. Mm -hmm. And when you challenge status quo thinking, religion, concepts, programming, brainwashing, 
you know, I've learned that there is a, um, the fight or flight chemical yes. is epinephrine, norepinephrine in the blood. And when someone is challenged and their safety is at stake, like what happens when you challenge someone's doctrine on hell and, you know, how they've done all of this for their lives to make sure that they are safe. Um, when yes. you challenge that, that chemical is released into the blood and they immediately want to fight or flight. And so what happened to the pattern, and that's what Jesus was, he was a pattern. And he also said, if they did this to me, do you not think? So whenever we come up against these rigid thought structures, we're going to be attacked. Mm -hmm. It's part of the process of becoming, because what has to happen to each one of us is that egocentric mode of being has to go to the cross and experience death, but also resurrection. The ego is supposed to partner with divinity because the ego is the mechanism that can focus thought and emotion. It's the only mechanism that can focus thought and emotion. And so therefore this, this powerful creative component component that comes from being human has to experience its own death. And the picture of that is this Christ figure riding on the donkey, which is the ego, to death. Mm -hmm. And so all of these attacks that we experience and being called Satanists and, you know, being called every name, you're a witch, you're this, you're that, it's all good because they're only doing what's been given them to do as am I. And so I have to recognize that the ego, and I'm not there, but I recognize the process and the pattern that that has to come to a place of unconditional surrender to its counterpart, which is the father, the creative principle of the universe. And see, I believe that, you know, if, if sitting here and in my front door walked God, and God wanted to smoke a cigar, have a good glass of wine, wanted to um, smell a baby's newly you know, washed hair, wanted to have sex. Any of these human pleasure things, it could not do without a physical body to experience it through. So I believe that the earth is a school. I believe that we have all signed up as divinity to come to take on a human form, to partner with divinity, because what divinity is about is to create material worlds without end. Right now, I believe that spirit has a non-physical, non-tangible, um, body unless it has a helpmate mm -hmm. and so that is that's when you accept and surrender that is Emmanuel or God with man that's the yes. human being becoming Christed and the ego is well on its way to you know that donkey ride into death and then it gets to spirit experience resurrection and that finishes out the tenure of school here on earth. And you go into other places and realms to grow, to experience, to create worlds without end. That's what I believe is the main purpose here. Divinity is seeking a helpmate and that helpmate is you. And every, every experience that divinity has, regardless of what it is, serves us. Yes, that's beautiful. So Barbara, would you agree that absolutely everybody that is awakening, especially when they come out of the fundamental Christian background is riding that donkey? Uh, at some point they will. Yes. But you know, there are those that, you know, when we see this environment in duality 
-hmm. of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a prerequisite to immortality. I'll say that again. Yes, say that. Paul said at the end of, of Hebrews 5, he said, look, people, I want to teach you about the power of an endless life. I want to teach you about Melchizedek, who has neither mother nor father, nor beginning nor end of days. But I can't teach you because you are babes. You don't have meat. You don't even have teeth to chew this information. You've had milk for too long. Therefore, leaving the elementary principles behind, let us go on to perfection. But it says that um, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil exercises our senses and says that it is actually a prerequisite to perfection. So hold on, hold on, hold on, because you just said something. Let's say that again. <laughs> Woo, opening up some can of worms. Okay. So eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil sets us up to what? We have to experience, we have to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it exercises our senses and gets us to where that we can discern between good and evil so that we can go on to the age to come. It is necessary. So baptism, let me say this, baptism is not about getting wet underwater. Baptism is supposed to remind us of our journey as biological beings. Yes. Divinity coming into our DNA yes. and experiencing this immersion into being completely human. That's what baptism is. And, and what we call communion is the same thing. It's broken bread. We lay down our divinity, our immortality. We travel into this uh, realm of duality and sin and sickness and, and death. And we go into the belly just like Jonah did. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're told, do this in remembrance of me, of who? Of Christ. Is it outside of me? No, it's inside yeah. of me. And it's reminding me of my own journey as a God-man learning through the... What does it say? What is, how does Christ learn? It is said of he, the Christ, that he learned obedience through the things that he suffers. So here we are in the earth school banging it out because our emotions are so creative that when we focus thought and emotion, we create reality. Yes. So how do we learn how to emote? by experience yes jesus raised lazarus from the dead with grief yes he didn't say you know uh hey lazarus why don't you just come up no he groaned deeply because he was familiar with affliction and suffering so he used his experience we use our experiences here in the earth school and when we dismiss judgment which ties us to this dimension. It's like a lean yeah. that we use to create just this mortal environment. When we suspend judgment and we tap into pure, unadulterated emotion and focus, we can do whatever we want. So Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead using grief. And the key to understanding this is that Lazarus is you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Christ mm -hmm. is you. Mm -hmm. Mary and Martha is you. It's all aspects of us as we learn through the things that we suffer. So all of our experiences serve us. Just like that voice that said to me of Chris, hey, he chose this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But who would choose that? But yeah. from the format before we incarnate, we don't choose according to the knowledge of good and evil because we're not eating from that tree yet. We're not human. So why do we make choices? We make choices based on purpose and what it is going to be. So I can no longer judge the, the homeless person on the street because they're far beyond where I am. Mm -hmm. I live a good life. I have a comfortable mm -hmm. life. In this life, I have chosen this, but I'm sure in another I experience something different and it adds to my escrow as a creative being. So everything serves us. There is nothing without value and purpose. 
Wow. Okay. I want to say something to the viewers and then I want to go back to something because I, something you said about the tree of um, the knowledge of good and evil, because we just want to, we just want to take care of some dot, some I's and cross some T's for the viewers. I do want to say this though. We have to remember you guys that God divine source is a multidimensional being. Okay. And the word is a multidimensional word. So though some of you believe that the word is just literal, what Barbara is saying is also definitely part of the heart of the father because we're talking about multidimensional with the father is not this or that, is this and this and this and this because we can never fully attain, never the multifacetedness of who he is only by choosing to embark on a journey which is what Barbara is talking about so I just want to make sure that you understand that the viewers watching yes you can say the word the bible is literal but there is it's also so multi-dimensional that it also carries the allegorical powerful pictorial um aspects of who we are called to become and to be and to walk out and to transform and to do so i wanted to point that out now barbara so let's go back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because i know you have heard this and i've heard it well what are you saying now is if if this was part of the sin of Adam and Eve, how can then us eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil be good? So do, what do you have for people that may be asking that? I can answer it kind of in a metaphor and remind me if I rabbit trail too much to go back to the question. Mm -hmm. so a seed falls from a mature source Absolutely. and it has to die. It splits apart. Its roots descend, it accesses the treasures of the darkness in that soil, and then it is able to have a strong enough root system that it can turn and begin to ascend. So we have had an over-identification with sin and the sin processes, and we've had that beaten into our head, and we That's fail it. to see the beauty of the environment that has been created for us in the dimension where we discern between good and evil. And let me tell you, anybody, anybody that discerns between good and evil is eating from that tree. Come on. And they're not wrong. Yeah. They are exercising their senses because I'm telling you, and this is the part that gets a little woo woo, but when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he grieved in his spirit because he had experienced death and grief mm -hmm. anyone looking at that would call that evil especially if it was a child that was killed by, by accident or whatever but jesus learned how to manufacture and to distribute something so powerful mm -hmm. that these experiences were necessary but what he demonstrated is that that same experience brought life so how can we say eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is wrong? It is part of being human. Mm -hmm. It is part of being human. And I'll tell you what, you go to any church today, and if they are going to be talking politics and damning this and criticizing that and calling this and that evil, guess what tree they're eating from? Yes, it is the knowledge of good and evil. And that is a tree that we are told not to eat from if... We want to live. So in the meantime, while we're here banging it out, being human, learning and growing from our experiences, there's also another tree and another age that is present. Yes. And we can either work with what's breaking down, which is this present age of darkness, or we can work with what's breaking through. And if someone is deciding, I'm going to resist, I'm going to battle, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, they're working with what's breaking down and they're not wrong. Mm -hmm. If someone says, I'm going to focus on light, 
I'm going to raise my vibration. I'm going to make a path and a pattern into the age to come. They're not wrong. Mm -hmm. Everybody has, everybody has a place. And for those that are, um, you know, there's a parable and it talks about how, and this is, this is, describes the present state of our reality in this world. But it says that the vineyard is let out to other vine dressers that beat the servants. Yeah. It is purposeful. Light and dark are the same to thee. They work in tandem with all that is to bring about this classroom where we learn duality. It's not wrong. Now, we may be good and tired of it, <laughs> and we may be ready to transition, but we cannot forsake who brought us to the dance. And that was learning how to emote, how to focus thought in this dimension. And we learn by the things that we suffer. And it still serves us. Yes. Yes. You know, it's interesting because um, you have the scripture that says, my people perish because of lack of knowledge. So, you know, when you couple that with what you're talking about, I believe knowing is part of maturing. Mm -hmm. A yep. baby does not understand he has no knowledge because he's limited to the experiences as a baby. The more a child matures, the more knowledge he has. So, you know, um, I, I totally agree with you totally uh, regarding the tree of uh, the good and evil. There's something there, again, that was put in the Bible that I believe is not quite what the heart of the father was in that matter. Uh, so I'm going to leave that at that because I don't want to continue to open up more cans of can of worms. Uh, but, you know, Barbara, what I love what you said, um, I want to tag on that is what you're saying basically is walk your path. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is what we're trying to do with the quest for truth. This this, this platform, Hidden Mysteries TV. Um I, I'm so blessed to be able to bring different speakers that carry different facets and frequencies of truth. Now, as I say it many times, you know, I may not agree with everything, but I'm choosing to align and unify, unite with the frequency of the truth that they bring, because that is the heart of the father that we unite. So I love that you even said that, um, you know, walk your path. And you walk in your path. I'm not going to sit here and call it wrong because if that's what you're supposed to bring, just light and butterflies. And if that's what you're called to do, walk that out. And who am I to attack you? If my path is to look at this and say, this is evil, we have to do something to stop the atrocities that are happening to the children. So I love that you're saying that because that really creates a picture of unity. Yeah, absolutely. And I absolutely loved, I'm, Barbara, I'm so sick and tired of the attacks that are happening. And what I was telling Wendy today, it's like, it's, it's to a place where it's cannibalism. If I don't agree with what you're saying, I'm going to then attack you and rip you apart. It's horrific. It's horrific. So what I'm hearing you say, all this to say, what I'm hearing you say is let's unite and you walk your path. I walk my path and unite in that. And it's, 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 it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Um, and it's what is needed because united, we stand divided, we fall. So, um, so thank you for sharing that. Now, I don't want to keep you much longer because um, I know you have to go to your beautiful grandbabies, but um, Barbara, what do you have to say to a viewer that's watching that is awakening out of their maybe spiritual amnesia and realizing that there's so much more to who the father is so much more to the message of Yeshua and so much more to who they are than what they have been told and programmed through control, fear, and manipulation. What do you say to people that are like, I'm feeling, I'm feeling this frequency inside of me calling me saying that that was created for more. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm afraid. What do I do? What do you say to them? Follow your joy because you can't get this wrong. We can't get this wrong. 
Mm. And if we, if we are able to tap into that frequency of joy and follow that, because when we chose our path, remember when I said that, um, you know, they told me that Chris had, had chosen this. Yes. I have to honor his path, knowing that his stepping stones are joy. And whatever he puts his foot on, or we put our foot on and we feel joy, that's right where we should be. And I would also say that, um, just to kind of button up something you had said earlier, if I really understand that I am a powerful creator imbued with divinity, yes. then I will be careful of what I focus upon and emote toward because I will create. Mm -hmm. And so determining what your call is, mm -hmm. if you're called to work with what's breaking down again, not wrong. Mm -hmm. If you're called to work with what's breaking through, not wrong. We just have to follow individually what it is that brings joy and satisfaction and a feeling of purpose and completion. And so for me, um, because I've, I've walked this now for almost 23 years, I understand the mechanics of creation and I really understand what it's like to be neutral and to enter into appreciation Mm -hmm. Because the school is getting ready to birth the God man. Yeah. Complete with a repertoire of how to live and emote in uh, our creative potential and abilities. One thing that, that I have to say is someone might ask, why? Why do we have to learn these lower frequency things like despair? I mean, deep, dark despair. How can that possibly serve us? And I'll say this, you know, Paul said, there is a lack of suffering and affliction in the body of Christ that must be filled up in my body. There is a lack of suffering and affliction in the body of Christ that must be filled up in my body. What I saw when I studied that was that we have this palette of color and that if we are lacking the red, the blues, the pinks, the orange, the purple, the if we're lacking, we only paint with white or black and we need contrast. So we need all of these experiences to teach us how to emote because I'll tell you, when Jesus groaned for Lazarus, mm -hmm. that was a deep dark place he went to, but it was highly creative and life-giving because it's a frequency that is necessary. So all of our experiences, you know, one frequency of grief, grief raised a dead body Who's to say that another very powerful guttural groan didn't raise my son off the side of a highway? Right. Who's to say that it won't create a star nursery? Who's to say it won't form the iron core of a planet? Am I going to do that with joy? No, I think that's reserved for butterfly wings or feathers. But we need this full repertoire of the knowledge of good and evil and how to create that frequency by our experiences. We need this all. It's for our education. And so right now, the way that the world sits, we're doing a hell of a job learning <laughs> everything that's out there. We're banging it out and it's not wrong. We just need to appreciate the path that we're on and know that we're going somewhere and know that we can't get it wrong. Yeah, that's so beautiful. So beautiful. Barbara, one last thing. I want to go back to something because it's it it's very powerful what you said. I want to go back to something that you that you said at the beginning when you were talking about where you began to question certain things. Let's go with regarding health, because that's what you were mentioning at the beginning. 
I liked very much what you said that how can a God that is a God of love and that says to love your enemies, can let's pick up on that and explain to the viewers your point of reference regarding this truth that you have embraced. Because many people are questioning hell, even among, um, well, much more so among the mystics, Christian mystics, they are questioning hell um, and that whole thing that we were told. So please share with us your point of view, your reference, the truth that you bring regarding this. In my reality, there's no hell. I don't fear hell. I don't fear separation or torture. Somebody else may believe in it. And because they are powerful creators, right. they will experience that. Um, but I have to go with what I feel and what I know about this creative principle that governs the universe. And the example that I can give is there is nothing any of my kids or grandkids could do, nothing yeah. that would ever make me torture someone forever in fire because they didn't do something right. Come on, people. Yeah. It's time to awaken and to shed those grave clothes. That is not what God's about. That is not where we're headed. But the thing is, is that I can't teach somebody out of a mindset. They have to die yeah. themselves. They have to come to that place themselves and move from knowledge to knowing. That is an incredible, fantastic journey. And we're all going to get there. All of us. We may be playing different roles and there may be someone that, you know, has been given the task to bring you to the depths of hell. And they're only doing what they have been given, just like the vine keepers that beat the servants. There's a purpose for all of it. And the way that we transcend it, the way that we transmute that, that whole negative reality is simply by changing our focus because we are God, men. Yes. No one's coming on a white horse to save us. We are saving us. So we are the ones that must awaken and begin to shift our attention away from the darkness Correct. And towards what it is that we want to see. That's how powerful we are. And we will all get there, all of us. Yeah, it's so, so powerful. Oh my goodness, I, I could go in so many directions right now. You know, there is a saying that I heard uh, a dear lady that I absolutely love and honor um, that said, you only carry a dead body long enough to bury it. Mm -hmm. So, but we have been so used to carrying these, these dead bodies. And then if you carry it, it will, inf it, it will infect you. That's what they used to do during the Roman times as a punishment. It was to tie a dead body on top of the person and their punishment was to carry that body until their own body got infected. So I love that you're saying, change your perspective. Don't focus on that because you are powerful. You are creating that reality. Right. So that is, that is so powerful. Um, Barbara, thank you so much. Really fast. We are going to put all of Barbara's information at the end of the video regarding her books and how people can read your things and get a hold of you. Um, can you talk about your your two books just a little bit to give the audience a little um, insight on what they are about? Sure. the The first book, Escaping Christianity, Finding Christ, um, I wrote in two thousand fourteen, and I have to tell you, it's a powerful book. It, it is a book that um, a lot of people will be able to identify with, especially. Um, those that experience the programming and brainwashing like I did. And it just outlines the journey. Um, one of the, the greatest stories in escaping Christianity is a, is a, is a deer a buck that became caught in a, in a hog track here on a mm -hmm. hog trap here on our property and how it beat itself up, oh. you know, trying to escape and was bloody and torn cartilage and everything. But the thing is that the door was open 
And so you can't remain in structures that are purposefully installed in consciousness to help bring about this rich education. You can't go inside and change it. You have to leave through the open door. It's obviously not for you anymore. And what I did and the mistake that I made is I tried to change the system from the inside out rather than appreciating that it serves. It may not serve me right now. And if that's the case, I needed to get the heck out. And so I did. So the, the book Escaping Christianity kind of outlines, uh, outlines my journey mm -hmm. and what happened to me as I began to deprogram and the scriptures that came alive mm -hmm. um, rather than literal um, into more metaphor and allegory and understanding that it is probably the richest, the Bible is the richest book that we have on the planet and it will bring us to a level of maturity if we look at it literal but it will not bring us to completion unless we see the rich mystical value of scripture and then the second book musings it's just a compilation uh, someone had asked me boy you know i sure do wish you could put all of your facebook articles in a book and i thought well yeah i can do that and so that's what that is it's the six years after writing my book escaping that i compiled and it's a thick book it's 444 pages of articles that um yeah, you can go through like a um a journal i guess but each one offers something different wow 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 that sounds amazing um you know, I want to, before I let Barbara go, um, I want to speak to really fast to the viewers out there. I want to encourage you to remember, only eat what you feel that is for you. We have had such, we were programmed to believe that we have to throw the bones out with the meat or throw out the baby with the water. And I want to encourage you to, we're not here to, Barbara's not here to convince you I'm not here to convince you of anything. I'm here to inform you. Barbara's here to inform you. The choice is up to you, what you will do. So my, what I wanna encourage you is go in the most sacred place that there is in all creation, every dimension, every realm, which is the heart of God, the heart of the father, divine source. And if something, if you don't understand something, let him speak to you from the inside, from inside the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God is inside of you. When you go within side of you and that because you're inside of you, inside of the father, because remember in him, you move, you live and you have your being. Go in there and only you and him. And if you don't understand something, if something doesn't make sense to you, ask, ask your heavenly father, ask him. Stop asking Tom, Dick and Harry ask your heavenly father and you know what some things maybe you have to just put on the shelf that's okay again just eat the part of the steak that you can chew if you see that there are bones throw them out that's fine nobody's forcing you but if a part of the meat is too hard for you or something put put it in the fridge or put it up on the shelf please understand part of maturity is learning to eat what you can and the rest leave for later or just throw out the rest but don't negate everything. Don't. That's part of us growing. So you guys, I encourage you. This is how we build relationship. Jesus came to show us relationship, not religion. That's part of what he did. So this is what we're talking about. What Barbara sharing with you is to encourage you to build relationship with yourself, relationship with who father truly is. He's your father. So Barbara, thank you so very, very much for bringing to us the beautiful facets and the frequency of truth that you carry that has been inter intertwined in and through you with some pain. Thank you for sharing that with us because of your journey, because your, your willingness to walk that journey, you are now able to come and share this beautiful frequency of truth that you are releasing to people that are helping, that is helping people um, that, that are watching and through everything you do on your Facebook, in your incredible book, some of the articles that you have written that are quite amazing. Um, so thank you for doing that. And thank you for being here. Thank you. It was really nice to meet you.
Right. Very nice to meet you. And you guys, again, we're going to put all of Barbara's information, her books, how you can read more of, uh, of what she's writing, her incredible articles that she writes, she talks about. And thank you so much for being here with us. I really hope that this has blessed you and stretched you um, to come out of this comfort zone that we've been lulled in. And um, thank you again for watching, Barbara. Thank you for being with us. You guys, until next time, be blessed and we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.